Welcome all of you to the Peggy Downs Baskin Ethics Lecture Series hosted by the Humanities Institute. I'm Jasmine Allender, and it's my privilege to serve as the new Dean of the Humanities Division at UC Santa Cruz. Our division houses eight departments and several programs, all of which foster innovation and interdisciplinarity in ways that make the humanities at UCSC distinctive. We have one of the largest, oldest, and most lauded departments in feminist studies, a literature department that's unique in its engagement with literatures and cultures across the globe, a growing program in critical race and ethnic studies with a new minor in black studies. We're home to the history of consciousness, the premier interdisciplinary graduate program in the country. Our philosophy department embraces historical approaches, the philosophy of science and ethics. Our languages department offers courses in a dozen languages, including Arabic, Persian, and Punjabi, as well as a major and minor in Spanish studies. Three of our faculty in our top ranked department of linguistics recently won a National Science Foundation grant to support their research on endangered languages. And a faculty member in history was just awarded a prestigious public scholars grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. If it's not clear, I'm incredibly proud of the faculty, staff, and students of UCSC Humanities who work hard to achieve excellence in their learning, teaching, research, and service. A recent report from Georgetown Center for Education and Workforce asserts that the liberal arts act as a kind of vaccine that inoculates its students against authoritarianism. Here at UCSC, students learn to think for themselves. They learn to deliberate, they learn to evaluate evidence, and they learn to advocate against injustice. I believe deeply in the humanity's potential to transform lives for the better, in our potential to create engaged, empathetic, informed members of our communities and our world. In this stressful, anxious time, the work we do in the humanities is the work of democracy. This lecture series is made possible by the Peggy Downs Baskin Humanities Endowment for Interdisciplinary Ethics, a fund that was created in honor of Peggy's interest in the study and public dialogue of ethical questions. Peggy taught in our feminist studies department and is also an author, photographer, and philanthropist. We're thrilled to hold this event in her honor. Thank you to the entire Baskin family for your tremendous impact on our campus. This is the ninth time we've come together to have a discussion about prominent ethical questions that span multiple disciplines. This year, we have the privilege of hearing from Ezra Klein and Will Davis, two leading political and cultural voices who help us navigate the contemporary world. They are the newest additions to a list of notable speakers in this lecture series, including Margaret Atwood, Jaron Lanier, Fania Davis, and the late Toni Morrison. It's remarkable that in addition to this impressive list of names associated with this lecture series, the Humanities Institute has also enriched our lives over the past few years by hosting Madeleine Albright, Colson Whitehead, Malcolm Gladwell, and most recently, ta Coates, to name a few. I would like to thank the Humanities Institute for its stellar work, bringing so many distinguished speakers to our local and alumni communities. Many of these events were made possible by strong and invaluable partnerships on and off campus for which we are deeply grateful. Before I introduce our speakers and we dive into our conversation, I'd like to share a few details about the event. We are using a Zoom webinar tool, so there is no chat function but please use the Q&A tool to submit your questions at any time. There will be ample time after the conversation for Q&A. Finally, this event is being recorded. Thank you all for joining us and let's get on with the show. I'm delighted to now introduce our two speakers. William Davis is professor of political economy 
at Goldsmiths University of London. He's author of several books, most recently, This Is Not Normal, The Collapse of Liberal Britain, and Nervous States, Democracy and the Decline of Reason. He's a regular contributor to the London Review of Books and The Guardian, and has also written for the New York Times, New Republic, and The Atlantic. Professor Davis recently spent considerable time with our college scholar students, UCSC's first year's honors program, discussing his book, Nervous States, which they read in fall quarter. Many of those students are with us today, and we look forward to hearing some of their questions later in the program. Ezra Klein is the founder of Vox, and for the last eight years has been the editor at large at the news website. He is the host of the award-winning podcast, The Ezra Klein Show and the author of the best-selling book, Why We're Polarized. His career includes stints as a columnist and editor at the Washington Post, a policy analyst at MSNBC, and a contributor to Bloomberg. He's written for The New Yorker and The New York Review of Books. And most importantly, he's a banana slug, attending UC Santa Cruz for two years as a Stevenson College student before transferring to UCLA to earn a degree in politics. Ezra just announced that in January, he will be moving on from Vox to become a New York Times opinion columnist and podcast host. Thank you both for being here with us today. We're really looking forward to this conversation. And with that, I will leave you both to it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, very generous introduction. And, and thanks so much for um, the privilege of um, joining you all here today, and particularly for the opportunity to uh, engage in dialogue with Ezra, whose work I've admired uh, over recent years. Um, I think I'm going to start off this part of the conversation, and then hopefully it's going to turn more into a, a dialogue as we, as we move on. Um, but I wanted to start by just identifying some of the common themes that I think we're concerned with here this evening, or I say this evening, this morning, <laughs> um, which is, um, I mean, both Ezra and I in our recent books, Ezra in his book, Why We're Polarised, uh, and me in my book, Nervous States, which I think is one of the reasons why um, some of my ideas are, uh, overlap with some of Ezra's concerns, is that what we're doing, I think, in both of these books is trying to step back to achieve some kind of distance on some of the political turbulence and the conflicts of recent years that have occurred both in the United States but also around the world. Um, and what I particularly admired about Ezra's analysis in Why We're Polarized is the way in which he achieved a kind of distance from the present moment to not simply blame some of the kind of turbulence and the conflict on Donald Trump himself or on some of the kind of recent technologies that have invaded the public sphere of social media and the internet and, and, and so on, but actually steps right back to look at some of the kind of longer term shifts that have affected US politics in terms of the shifting alliances and the shifting coalitions of the Republican and the Democratic parties. But I thought that maybe one way we could kind of start this, this, this discussion would be to reflect on where we are right now, because obviously um, the United States has, in the last few weeks, things have changed. Um, and I thought maybe one way to kind of kick things off in terms of discussing the roots of polarization and perhaps the future of polarization was simply to kind of put the question of what, what surprised you in, in, in the events of, of the election and the aftermath? And, and then maybe we can sort of try to unpack what that means and what, where hope might lie for the, for, the coming, for the coming years. No, we have to do hope. <laughs> uh, so first, thank you for the, the, the kind introduction. Also, I'm thrilled to be here and very sad not to actually be there. Um, the fact that we're doing this on Zoom and I don't get to come hang out in Redwoods this weekend is, uh, is a tragedy. Um, and I miss, I, I miss Santa Cruz all the time. And I was saying to, to some of the folks before we started today, this book actually got finished at Santa Cruz when I needed to get it done. And I have a, a young kid in the house, which is not good for book writing. Nobody tells you that, but it's not good for book writing. Uh, I went and got a, a hotel room in Santa Cruz for eight days and just spent every day at Lulu Carpenter's writing. So this book goes a lot to, a lot to Lulu's. What surprised me in the election? Um, here's what surprised me about the election. I wrote a whole book about polarization, uh, as you've heard, 
And if you look at the beginning of that book, the fundamental thing it sets out to explain is why is there such unnerving stability in American politics? Why were you able to go from a candidate as normal uh, within the long-term structures of the parties and the ideological coalitions as Mitt Romney in 2012 to a candidate as abnormal as Donald Trump in 2016? And really, if you take a step back, see very little change in the voting patterns of the electorate. You really had an election, uh, an election in 2016 that looked like 2012 with a bit of change on the margins that led to a different outcome walked by the Electoral College. And so the entire book is set up to explain the stability and the decisions we make. Now, if you had told me day after I published that book, which actually is not too, too different from how the timeline worked out because uh, the book published in, I think it was January, um, that over the next year, America and the world would be buffeted by a pandemic virus that would lead to the deaths of 200,000 people in America, more than that, in fact, that our response would be one of the worst in the developed world, um, certainly for most of that period, that, the pre that we would have a huge, huge, huge recession, and that the president would, uh, by pretty wide acclamation, not respond to this in a steady or disciplined way. I would have said, well, that is the rare kind of event that can crack polarization. I would say that is a rare kind of event that is so immediate in its consequence, so tangible, so nearby in what it can do. It can kill your mother or your father or your friend or you. And it, for many people did. That that is where politics stops being played and starts getting real, to, to borrow the old real, real world line. And I would have expected to see substantial change, not overwhelming necessarily, but some significant change in the president's approval ratings, in polling, et cetera. And what surprised me about the election is we didn't. If you look, one, so I, I did this calculation, I haven't done it more recently, but I did this calculation um, right after the Republican convention or right before, I'm sorry, the day of Donald Trump's speech at the Republican convention. If you looked a year ago, Donald Trump's approval rating in that year with everything that had happened. And by the way, that year also included impeachment. Donald Trump's approval rating went up one point, uh, went up one point and down, and his disapproval rating went, down, went up three points. So functionally nothing happened. And so that to me was striking. In a way, I didn't believe the thesis of my book enough. And this is something I'd like to hear, hear you on, Will. There's a lot about politics that is abstraction. A lot of it is about who you end up trusting, and thus that becomes what you end up believing, right? I, I mean, how much do I truly know about climate change? Not that much. I don't go and do, you know, testing of carbon, um, uh, carbon concentrated in the atmosphere. And so it's all about who I choose to trust because a lot of it is uh, it's second order or third order knowledge. But that is not true with a virus. It's not true with a pandemic. So I would have thought that when things get that much more direct, that that cracks through the abstractions of politics and forces people to make more direct judgments about how the world around them is being governed and about whether or not the people in power have their interests in heart and are actually protecting them and their loved ones. And the fact that the forces of polarization were as capable in, in this moment as they were at every other moment, basically, was striking to me. But, but in your book, Will, you have a lot about the role of physical health and physical pain in politics, I thought it was a really striking chapter. Um, I found it very persuasive, but then when I sat back and thought about it, some of the same people that you were talking about there who you were explaining as voting for populists because their physical health had been um, negatively affected by politics in recent years, well, they were in much worse shape now and they're still voting for the same people. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious how and whether or not the pandemic has ended up pushing any rethinking of this part of it for you. I mean, in terms of that, I mean, yeah, you, you referred to, to, to a part of my book, which looks at um, the, the fact that, that, that I talk about how the human body, like how a sense of our own mortality starts to play into politics in certain respects. Uh, and it's certainly the case, I think, in, you know, people look at the, the rise of, of the Le Pen vote in France, which correlates quite closely to kind of deteriorating health outcomes and falling life expectancy in certain parts of of, of, of the population and um, certainly I mean you know we have these kind of I mean in the UK the the, the most acute form of polarization in British voting habits is by by age um, more than anything else um, and of course that also kind of correlates to certain kind of relationships to to to, to health and, and morbidity and, and and so on and I mean I think that the, the US 
um, story. I mean, part of what I talk about in the in, in, in that chapter in the book is that there, you know, there have been, I mean, this has probably been exaggerated, but certainly in those particular areas of, of, of the United States, which kind of flipped from, from Obama to Trump in 2016, there was this kind of kind of mapping of, 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 of particularly acute um, uh, sort of rise of, of morbidity and, and, and mortality rates in some of those particular counties. I don't think it generalizes very far, but that was partly what the what the kind of my hypothesis was to try and understand some of those trends. Um, I think that psychologically, I think that I suppose my my, my argument is that um, uh, an awareness of our own um, mortality and our own um, uh, physical vulnerability can can lead in different directions. It can lead towards a uh, a, a politics of of care and a politics of, of 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 mutuality and solidarity, or it can lead to a politics of of of, of authoritarianism fundamentally, of, of of a politics of of a demand for greater security and a demand for greater punishment of other people. I mean, this is kind of um, psychologically is, has, has been studied in, in, in various ways. I think that in terms of the, the, the pandemic, I mean, we in the UK, we haven't had the same polarization around the um, around sort of lockdown policies and this sort of thing that has happened in the United States. And even amongst people on the kind of what we call a, the sort of hard Brexit kind of nationalist right, um, even there, I mean, it doesn't translate into particularly kind of uh, libertarian type policies. In fact, actually, you know, there were plenty of areas that, uh, apart from the kind of economic harm that goes with some of these, these policies, there's still a kind of demand that, you know, we should all stay indoors. So it doesn't seem to kind of work in quite the same way. What I would say in terms of, you know, in terms of your, your sense of surprise is that um, I suppose a virus in particular operates according to a, a, an epidemiological logic, obviously, uh, and it, it, impl it implies that, that society matters, that, 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 that the collective matters, um, and that it is a, a type of risk that can only really be handled at the level of some kind of offer of, of social security and social action and 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 um, kind of and, and and of some kind of solidarity, some kind of um, uh, uh, concern with the, with the collective. And I suppose that in, in that respect, you know, that's the that's the problem. And we do see this in in, in the UK on on certain parts parts of the conservative right of people who simply kind of you know want to kind of open up the economy and this sort of thing but i think that that's part of the problem i mean what we what we've seen what the virus invites is um kind of competent social democratic government um and i think that you know that that, that there is a kind of obvious sort of strong resistance um to competent government by certain corners of the population but particularly to a type of government that in some ways has been kind of in decline in many societies around the world um for, for some decades which involves the sort of you know the calculation of risks at a collective level which in really is sort of something that has you know, health services of, of, of various kinds have been kind of trying to trying to push back on that in various ways. Um, I mean, do you do you see the 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 do you see the 2020 electoral result symbolized more of the same in that sense, more polarization, or was there was there anything that you think signified a, a sort of a tempering of some of the trends that you you describe in your book? It's all on the margin, so. To play to type here a little bit, I want to say that I am nervous about just those stories about any of the elections, right? Because if I could tell the story the other way, right? If I could say, if I can imagine telling a justice convincing tale about how we ended up with a huge vote swing because of the pandemic, or, you know, then I always worry that I'm overfitting my explanation. You know, it's the great value of the pundit looking backwards to just say, oh yeah, I came up with a good story for how this all went down. Um, but whether or not it's true is is always the the, the the tougher question. I think I'm going to stick to the idea for a sec that if you had read me the outcome of the twenty six of the twenty twenty election and I hadn't known any of the dramatic events, if you just told me in twenty eighteen this is how twenty twenty is going to go, like I am a genie and the, I've now given you the information, I said yeah that makes total sense that that looks like a totally reasonable map. Um, so I continue to be surprised at its stability. Uh, so in that way, no, I don't think that it showed a weakening of, of polarization. 
The one thing that is interesting, but one of the problems now is that we don't have very good data on it because the, the way voting played out was so weird and our exit polls are no good. And so it's very hard to say what actually happened here is that for the talk, for all the talk of racial polarization in the country and for all that what was fundamentally felt to be understood about Donald Trump was that he was sort of like a bigoted xenophobic candidate who was maximizing his share of the white vote at the cost of alienating um, black and brown voters, it's pretty clear that what changed on the, again, on the margin of the 2020 election is that Trump did a little bit better, particularly among Hispanic voters, but maybe even a little bit better among black voters, although I don't think we actually know that, um, and then did a little bit worse among working class white voters. And much and continues to do terribly among um, college uh, educated white voters. And so he basically traded some black and brown voters for some white voters. That's an electorally inefficient trade and he lost. And so that was not the narrative that was being told about Donald Trump. We were seeing that in the polls, by the way, all through this year. So it wasn't a surprise, um, but it is interesting. But again, it's hard to say what to make of it because these changes are very small. Like the truth is, overwhelmingly, Black voters voted against Donald Trump. Overwhelmingly, Hispanic voters voted against Donald Trump. And if white voters were the only ones who voted, Donald Trump would have won by a convincing major majority margin. So you can get very caught up on the things that change because the changes are interesting, but the changes are small compared to the stability. So I continue to think that the key question in American politics is to try to explain the this, this stability more than the change. Now, one thing though, that I do think is very important, I think I, in retrospect, I would like to focus, it, focus on it in the book more, and I'm curious how much you see it in the UK, is educational polarization is becoming more profound. And it is particularly here becoming more profound among white voters. So a very important dynamic that changes the way the two parties react to polarization in this country is that the, white voters are are quite divided between the two parties so if i remember correctly and I, I could get this wrong but i think it is a fair it is a fair uh, um rough count that trump won white voters something like 55 to 45 but please don't quote me on that because it could be off by a couple points in either direction um but black voters were overwhelmingly democratic asian voters were quite democratic hispanic voters were quite democratic um and so one of the things that happens in American politics is that white voters sort by more other things between the two parties than um, black and brown voters. So the Democratic Party has a lot of conservative black voters. It has a lot of conservative Hispanic voters. And that actually ends up driving its decision making very importantly. So Joe Biden wins because functionally more conservative black voters save him in the Democratic primary. That is not a force the Republican Party has. It doesn't have liberal white voters. It doesn't have liberal black voters in there operating as a, as a poll in one direction or another. But so one thing that's happening among white voters is very sharp educational polarization. And so it's something that has been profound in the Donald Trump era is that uh, Republicans are winning more working class white voters and losing college educated white voters by pretty big margins, which wasn't how it used to be. Uh, I think actually the educational polarization was reversed uh, a couple decades ago. And so that's also creating an interesting question of what is education standing in for there? It's all kinds of cultural signifiers. You talk a lot about this in the book around sort of the, the ways that technocrats claim to speak for society. There is certainly an aesthetic that, you know, Elizabeth Warren is an incredibly appealing candidate to college educated white voters. Like she does great among them in the Democratic primary, but did terribly among um, uh, uh, non-college uh, Democratic voters. And um, on the other hand, Donald Trump is incredibly aesthetically repulsive to those kinds of voters. But the things they find repulsive are not, um, do not read the same way to, to, to voters who don't come from their cultural and educational milieu. We're here talking at, at UC Santa Cruz, which is, uh, of course, a, a university, as you may have heard, um, but also a, a very particularistic kind of one with very particularistic kind of politics and culture inside of it. And so that educational polarization, particularly among white voters here, is becoming really important. My sense is there are some similar dynamics on Boris Johnson and Brexit, but I'd love to hear how much it's mirrored in what you've, in, in, in what the UK has yeah. gone through. Well, I mean, I mean, also, I mean, it's worth noting, I mean, if, if, if anyone reads um, Thomas Piketty's um, second massive um, door-stopping book, which is Capital and Ideology, Piketty, for those who aren't familiar, is a French economist who's really kind of 
put the study of inequality onto the into, brought into the mainstream as an economic concern with his 2014 book Capital and, and uh, Capital in the 21st Century. And this this more recent one uh, charts how, in, amongst many other things, it charts how uh, center left parties all over the uh, liberal capitalist world have been. Um, uh, accumulating uh, votes from um, uh, college educated uh, voters and so this is a this is an international trend that Piketty sees as quite quite troubling because he thinks that it, what, this is one of the things that is opening the door in a place like France for the way in which uh, parts of the working class are being drawn towards uh, the far right of, of, of Marine Le Pen um, and it's happened in the UK I mean uh, the Labour Party um, the which is the, the party of the, the, the centre-left has become uh, hugely popular in London in a way that it wasn't under Margaret Thatcher. Um, it's become a party which is the party of even even when it was led by Jeremy Corbyn, who was a figure who was associated with the with the the, the, the hard left uh, for for five years. He stood down earlier this year. But even even under Jeremy Corbyn, it was a party that was attracting um, uh, overwhelming. It was it won a majority amongst amongst graduates. Now, one of the things, of course, that's happened well in the UK much more than in the United States is that, um, I mean, Tony Blair um, set a target of trying to raise the number of people going to university to 50%, which was a number that was kind of plucked directly from the United States. There was no other real reason why 50% is a kind of good number, um, but it was kind of rising from sort of 7% in the 1950s, the whole way up to kind of about close to 50% now. So that also adds a kind of generational uh, aspect as well, because it means that the vast majority of people born before the 1980s you know, do, do not have college degrees. Um, now, I suppose that so that 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 kind of kind of creates a kind of a mixture of a sort of generational divide with a with a with a um, educational divide. It also, incidentally, in the UK, I don't know how true this is in the United States. It also maps onto a onto a um, a, a, a divide in ownership of assets as well, because most people born before 1970 ended up kind of buying houses fairly cheaply and getting kind of pension funds which have done pretty nicely over the last 40 50 years um, and uh, meanwhile the kind of millennials have got degrees but don't own anything so there's a kind of a, uh, this is one of the other ways in which which things like brexit really kind of played out as a sort of split between sort of asset owning non-graduates um, versus people with degrees who might not actually own very much and therefore in some sense have a kind of interest in remaining part of a of, a, of an international economy because you know if you haven't got an international economy and you haven't got any assets and you've got a degree you need you know you need to have access to markets and you need to be able to move around and so on but I think it's interesting I you know the, the term culture war gets you know we, we really use this term culture war now in the UK in a way that we kind of hadn't until really the last four years um, and culture can often be a sort of you know a, a word that sort of stands in for lots of other things and, and and can rather can obscure as much as it reveals and of course you know people might look at Elizabeth Warren and some people say yeah I can identify with that person some people think no way um, but I think that you know I, one of the things I'm interested in is, is 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 variations in in trust levels and I mean we know that um, one of the things I, I talk about in my book is how um, trust in things like um, well, the mainstream media, um, I mean, I have sort of the statistics in my book, and, and you cover this at, at length in yours, of how um, Trump voters basically see kind of what they call the, you know, the, the mainstream media, but which is basically CNN, New York Times, Washington Post, that kind of thing. And they don't, they don't trust a word it says, or they don't trust, and they don't trust official government statistics. And they don't trust a kind of a, a I suppose, a narrative um, view of the world that in the past sought to provide the kind of very basis of, of certain kinds of consensus that you show have been kind of fragmenting for a long time, but which they, 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 they have deep suspicion of both um, mainstream politics and mainstream media. Um, they um, have, in some ways, there's a kind of a, a sort of a perceived cartel of how public discourse kind of has operated and I suppose the 1990s was the sort of high point of a kind of cartel politics in which the parties broadly agreed on the on the main kind of policy issues at play um there was um you know there was a there was a, a you know not so much in the United States but certainly in, in in much of Europe there was a relatively narrow set of opinions that were kind of on display in in, in the mainstream media which then got kind of you know bust open um 
in, in by particularly by the internet uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, obviously, the United States is a, is a different story. I think with things like talk radio and 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 and, and obviously the, the kind of foundation of, of, of things like Fox News in the in the mid 90s. But I think that you know that 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 desire to bust a cartel open and that desire to kind of um, break open a, a perceived sort of insider world is obviously kind of very powerful and, and continues to be to be um, kind of you know very very politically potent. So I mean we we do have the, the this this graduate non graduate divide is, is is definitely very powerful and we have a a conservative party that every time it gets into trouble it sort of starts to take pot shots at um, you know aspects of the liberal elite the kind of the establishment. I mean that's their kind of go to kind of thing when 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 their policies aren't aren't working they start to take on you know sometimes not quite the judiciary in the way that Viktor Orban might um, or, uh, but but nevertheless to sort of you know start to attack uh, human rights lawyers or start to attack the BBC or start to attack universities of themselves obviously one of the main targets um, and I know this is happening a lot in France now as well, this idea that universities are the kind of the enemy within is a kind of major part of, a, of, of, of the sort of populist discourse. I suppose that, I mean, one of the questions going forward in the United States context is, I mean, there's now, I mean, I don't know, how, you, maybe you can tell me how, how, how big it is, but there is now obviously a, 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 a political movement. I mean, one of the things which I, I found really fascinating, in, there were a couple of things in your book, which I, I, I kind of think had a lot of international resonance. One is this idea of what you call post-persuasion elections, where effectively elections are no longer about trying to kind of persuade the center ground to do anything. Now, of course, that has some quite beneficial effects for democracy in the sense that you have this massive surge in turnout because people aren't kind of, focusing on these few people any longer, but instead you're trying to kind of bring more people to your side um, who might be non-voters. But there's also, um, you know, this kind of asymmetric polarization where in some ways the right goes ever further off in search of kind of more support. But I suppose, um, what do you think is the kind of significance? And I mean, maybe it was kind of inevitable, but you've gotten, it seems to me from a, from a distance that there's now a, a major part of the, the right in America that basically doesn't accept the outcome of, of the of the of the presidential election. I don't know how. Maybe I'm exaggerating, or I don't know. Maybe no. I'm, no, yeah. I mean, no, you're probably if anything, if anything, I'm under not... under playing it. <laughs> right. Okay. So 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 how do you carry on having even post persuasion elections with that level of asymmetric polarization? So I'm going to do something. I'm going to put a pin in this because I want to come back to something you said earlier that gets to something I am trying to work out and really want to talk about here today. And then and then let's get to the to the election aftermath. You talked about low trust and high trust voters. So something that was a big player in how we're thinking about the election here, um, and I think it's probably gonna be on the minds of at least some of the people watching, is the polls were super wrong. And the polls were wrong in exactly the fucking way they were wrong in 2016, which it's okay to make mistakes, but you don't wanna make the same mistake twice. And I talked to lots of pollsters and lots of people looking at polls and everybody's like, well, you know, a lot of mistakes can get made, but they're probably not going to make the same one in the same states with the same people they made in 2016. But they did. The polls in Wisconsin were underestimated Trump vote by like eight points. The polls in Florida, the polls in Michigan, the polls in Pennsylvania. It was the same people who these pollsters were trying like hell not to undercount again, who got undercounted. So what happened? So one of the big theories for what happened, what appears to have happened, is that the way pollsters began understanding their mistake in 2016. So basically nobody responds to polls, right? Polling response rates are down to two to 4%. So of every 100 calls you make, two to 4% of people are like, yes, I will waste my time to take, you know, on this poll with you. So the question is, how do those people then map on to the electorate? The pollsters make all these assumptions about who's actually gonna vote and so on. So really polling is like a, it's a, it's a weird mixture of polling and then punditry, right? There's a set of backstage calculations being done to reweight the polling responses to say, this is what the electorate is gonna look like. The conventional wisdom after 2016 was that what polling had done was it had underweighted um, by education. So it did not understand the turnout that was coming among non-college whites in particular. And so it had not correctly weighted by education. And so if it did that in the future, it would get this right. It did that. It did a better job waiting by education. The problem is it turns out education was not, it was, education was related to, but not quite the thing that was creating the problem. So education appears, and this goes to what you were saying, education appears to have been 
like a by, like not a byproduct, a, a correlate of high trust and low trust voters. But it is not the case that it is the same thing as being a high trust or low trust voter. You can be college educated and be a low trust voter and, and, um, uh, and non-college and be a high trust voter. Uh, but then you get into this question, of, well, like what the hell is a high trust and low trust voter anyway? Like, are, are we even when we say that getting at the correct categorization? And interestingly, even in that term, I think you see something that's in your book, Will, which is the way the sort of commanding heights of the political system even use the language to talk about themselves, because it's not the case at all that low trust voters are low trust. They just don't trust me, right? Yeah. <laughs> A lot of them have tremendous trust in Donald Trump, in Fox News. I mean, trust it is like, like who are you going to believe, like me or your lying eyes kind of trust. Right, so they're not low trust voters. They don't trust the New York Times. They don't trust Vox. They don't trust UC Santa Cruz, God knows. But they trust someone. They trust something. So even the language we're using for them is, I think, obscuring to some degree what's going on. This is, a, I think, a, a genuine problem. If you look under the hood of my book, if you want to know my critique of my book, there is a there's a place I felt I couldn't end up going because we don't have the right language and, and information on it. So there was an initial, you talked about asymmetric polarization. I struggled a lot with a chapter on why is the Republican Party responding to these trends so differently than the, than the Democratic Party. Both of them are polarizing. Democrats are definitely moving ideologically left. But there's a kind of anti-system polarization happening among the Republican Party that is different. Republicans and, and folks on the right have, have um, clustered into a right-wing media ecosystem that does not have a correlate on the left. There are left-wing outlets or liberal outlets, but they are integrated with mainstream news sources and using mainstream approaches to reporting that is simply not true for what is happening with Donald Trump and OAN News or Donald Trump and Breitbart or Fox News and its competition with some of these players on the right. There is something genuinely different happening there. So why? So this ends up being a question that does not have a good answer. There's, uh, then you get into some place I don't really like going, which are psychological theories of, of the two parties. Now, of course, it's banal to say that there is going to be some psychological micro foundations to people's politics. Of course there have to be. There are psychological micro foundations to everything we do, right? We are people first. But having spent a lot of time in this research um, and having looked at it really closely, and I touch on it in the book, I don't think it is good enough to go into in detail. I don't think that um, we know what we are trying to measure. I think we have a lot of things that are like measuring the shadows on the walls of the kind of thing we're trying to get at. And so we have this problem where uh, I talk about this as, uh, as soil and flowers in other places. There is different soil in the two political coalitions, different soil for a lot of reasons, but one of those reasons is psychological, different kinds of people take root there and, and, and grow. There's a lot of political science that ends up putting a lot of weight on Newt Gingrich as having broken our politics. Um, but I always think the interesting thing is why did Newt Gingrich succeed in Republican Party politics? Why did Donald Trump succeed in Republican Party politics? Um, Fox News gets a lot of causal play as like what is pushing the Republican Party to the right. But Fox News would not be Fox News if that isn't what the audience wanted. And in fact, at times when Fox News has tried to moderate, the audience has not let it. Um, Fox News tried to take out Donald Trump in the first Republican Party debate. I think it's one of the centrally interesting and pivotal moments in American politics in the past five years. They failed. Like they put up their sort of more newsy anchors. They tried to tear Donald Trump apart. Donald Trump got into a huge fight with Fox News. That's where he famously says about Megyn Kelly. She had blood coming out of her, whatever. A year later, Megyn Kelly does not work for Fox News anymore. And Fox News has rebuilt its primetime lineup to be more Trumpy. So Fox News doesn't have all that much control, actually. It's in a kind of dynamic equilibrium with what the Republican Party base wants. So something is going on here, but we have all these words and terms and things we're trying to measure and control for. Education, okay, education isn't precise enough. Low trust, high trust, or maybe we should go down to the psychological work and say openness to experience. And we're, we, don't, we don't know what it is. There is something here that is, in, that is helping to decide what these coalitions want aesthetically, who they trust, yeah. what they are willing to do, like when a pollster calls them. And it's a little bit of a black box because human beings are on some level irreducibly complex, but they also are not so irreducibly complex that they don't cluster. And so yeah. this is a really tricky part of our politics right now. 
And, you know, you can try to get at it uh, like through big picture narrative or technocratic, like technocratic measurement. But whatever it is, I, I just want to say it's clearly, I don't think we understand it. And so there's something going wrong in our understanding of how voters work or, or, or what they're going to do, which ends up making it very hard to actually evaluate politics in any consistent or correct way. Yeah, I mean, let me just sort of have a, have a go. I don't, I'm not going to come up with the answer that you're asking for, I think. But I mean, let me just have a go at, at sort of responding to some of that, because I think that so this idea that, yes, these people do trust someone, but they don't trust, you know, CNN and they don't trust um, most of the federal government and, and, and so on. Um, and maybe they don't trust climate science and this sort of thing. Um, well, maybe trust is not the term that, that makes sense for what their relationship is to politics. I mean, trust is an interesting concept. And it, one of the things philosophically to, to kind of go back a little bit, people talk about post-truth uh, has been a term that's been thrown around with the rise of, I mean, our prime minister, Boris Johnson is, is famous as a liar. I mean, he's been sacked from multiple jobs for lying. He got sacked from a journalist job. He got sacked from a political job for lying. He's, a, he's not like Trump. He doesn't sort of like to tell like a thousand lies a day, but he, but he says things which basically he thinks he can walk away from the consequences of not being true. Um, and people know that and they don't care. And just the same with Trump, they know that and they don't care. So the question is, uh, are the people who vote for these people, are they looking for someone to trust or are they looking for someone to follow? And that's the distinction that I, that, that I think we can maybe kind of try to tease open because the, the term trust and the word truth have the same etymological root. And the, 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 the importance of trust to truth is that a, a, tr a truth sayer, let's say a, a scientist, someone who does an experiment and kind of find something out and then they report it to a journal and it gets passed on and that's kind of how kind of modern objective truth gets produced. That's basically the idea that people, they say something happened and it happened. You trust that their words are actually valid. And it's the same with a journalist, you know, that you trust that if, if you read something in the New York Times, then there is some evidence for it. And if you were to trace it upstream that you would find a kind of paper trail or some kind of accountability structure that meant that this thing actually had some kind of correspondence to, to an event in, in the world. Now, if you believe that all of those chains are actually kind of bogus in some way, and actually you believe that a lot of these people are actually just sort of looking out for themselves and, and serving their own interests because they all went to college together and so on. Um, I mean, there is a whole set of these kind of professions that often get lumped together as the liberal elite by populists of various kinds. And that includes many lawyers, it includes journalists, it includes regulators, um, government officials, um, uh, it includes uh, the kind of professional politicians in the kind of Hillary Clinton uh, variety. And the authority of these people is that they're trustworthy. That is, and to say they're trustworthy, like the scientists, is that when they say something, it corresponds to reality. Now, all it takes is for some of those people to be found out not to be as good as their word. So, for instance, you know, some, some aspect of something Hillary Clinton said didn't quite kind of stack up. And the whole thing starts to look like a kind of a, a, a sort of a, a sham in some respect. And that actually there is no way of knowing what's really going on here because all of these people, uh, they're, they're, they're not using words in quite the same rigid way that they, that they purport to. And in that sense, there's a sort of um, a, a space opens for a kind of antitrust politics in a way, which is not that Donald Trump speaks the truth because I mean, who can, couldn't really believe that? But, the, the, but if you follow tr Trump, he's gonna kind of take you to somewhere you wanna go in some way. But, and if you follow kind of, if you, if you are a sort of supporter of Fox News, um, it becomes much more like the relationship to a sports team or something like that. Interestingly enough, if you think of the relationship to these political uh, leaders as one of leader follower rather than um, trust, that is, I believe that your words are actually a, a valid reflection of reality. Um, it's interesting, I think, you know, that w where else in our media do we see the term follower crop up? Well, Twitter. So there's a sort of, you know, we live in a sort of a, a media sphere now where instead of trying to kind of validate things, we are so in some ways kind of um, deciding who we want to follow. So in that sense, kind of even liberals, even people with graduate degrees and people who work within the system, in some ways become engulfed in a similar sort of politics, which is one of effectively, well, yeah, you're, you, you follow those, you know, you follow those accounts, you follow, you know, the, the, the risk then is that the sort of CNN viewer, or the New York Times reader, is also a kind of a, a follower of, of, of something, is someone who basically gets kind of consumed by or gets, gets sort of drawn towards a certain, certain types of narrative. And the reason why those of us who do follow the mainstream media and, and, and trust the mainstream media. The reason why that's the case is in, in many ways, it's kind of the massive overabundance of information that we now 
live with that effectively this the, 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 there is the kind of sense that uh, you know that say the BBC in my own country you know they, they are also completely overwhelmed with data with with content with feedback and so on and in some and they get found out the whole time for kind of making mistakes and these expect mistakes get exposed uh, a, very, a lot of the time so in that sense there's a kind of you know I think that that, that um, the relationship between the kind of Trump believer and Trump is one that is not one that I think we should sort of celebrate, but I think that, you know, that the, the, there are kind of technological reasons in our kind of media ecology, which have meant that the sort of original vision of liberal trust in the words of the kind of honest sort of figure in public life has become sort of, you know, harder to sustain in this kind of sort of info glut uh, that, that we inhabit. And I think, you know, that's that's something which is a, is a real problem across the political spectrum, but that maybe the right kind of exploits it more more ruthlessly. So I have a couple thoughts on this. So one, I want to say, and I, and I want to ping something you said there, which is, do I, I don't want anybody on this call, because now we're all on calls, to think they don't do this. Yeah. This idea that New York Times readers or Vox readers or anybody is not doing this is ridiculous. We do not know anything on our own. The fundamental question at all times in the complex modern human life is who do you trust? Um, the Dean said here at UC Santa Cruz, we teach uh, students to think for themselves. And there is truth to that. And also there isn't. None of us are thinking for ourselves. We are all um, choosing who to outsource some gigantic portion of our thinking to. And you know, you can have better or worse rubrics for deciding who to trust, right? I mean, peer review is a rubric to help you trust what is written in a journal. But I mean, as we know in the replication crisis, a lot of things that make it through peer review don't turn out to be correct. So I want to note that like, if you scratch this, it, it's turtles all the way down. And, the, the, you know, and it is true for me, right? And, and, and it's true for all of us. Like, we, are all, we all live in, a, in an, an ontologically fallen world. Uh, but you can make better or worse decisions within that. I don't, think, I don't think that should put anybody to a course of nihilism. I just want to note that we all do it. You made the distinction, Will, between um, voters looking for somebody to trust and voters looking for somebody to follow. So this is a big thing in the psychological, the political psychological literature. Um, there is this thing called the authoritarian index. And I don't like the name of this because I, again, think they've named something in a way that is like very negative, um, but it's this weird four, it's like a four question scale basically about how do you discipline your kid? Like, do you hit them? Should they listen to you without talking back? And it turns out this is extraordinarily predictive of what kinds of candidates you vote for. If you are high on this authoritarian index, you're gonna vote for Donald Trump pretty, pretty routinely. Um, so there's something to that, but also, uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, it does not appear that Republicans in this country are good followers anymore on another level. So the Republican party is in a constant state of like quasi chaos because the loyalties of Republicans have become very, very changeable. So, you know, this authoritarian index, this Republicans just want a strong leader. That was why they all love George W. Bush was one answer. And then here comes Donald Trump that says George W. Bush is garbage and his whole family's garbage and Jeb Bush is garbage. And all these people make terrible deals and they've betrayed you and they deserve to be like thrown onto the ash heap of history. Trump is like, yeah, I guess screw those folks. You know, John McCain, right? Like. I prefer people who, I prefer soldiers who didn't get captured. It used to be the line in American politics that Democrats fall in love and Republicans fall in line. And it's actually become much the opposite now. Republicans fall in love and Democrats fall in line. There's no, I mean, Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden, those are fall in line candidates. Those were like the literal next in line candidates. And Democrats, um, often that's not where their heart was. Their heart was with Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren or Pete Buttigieg in some cases, but, but, but they went with like the next in line. And that is not how Republicans have been running their elections recently. Uh, across, by the way, a lot of different measures. At the same time, elite credentials matter a lot on the Republican side. I think this is always a very interesting part of conservative discourse. Uh, Donald Trump brags all the time about his degree from Warden. <laughs> <laughs> he brags about being an Ivy League guy. He brags about how his uncle was an MIT person uh, or something. I forget what his uncle actually was, but I think it was MIT. He brags about it all the time. There's a weird crank health guy who's become big in Republican circles during the pandemic, Alex Berenson. And he always is identified as an ex-New York Times reporter because his actual claim to elite status is that he once worked for the New York Times. 
Um, and this goes on everywhere. I, if you like, I see it all the time. There's actually a huge credentialism in conservative circles. Uh, it's just like, there's a, a great study by um, a Yale Law professor, Dan Kahan. I actually bring it up in my book, which everybody should buy at full price from wherever you buy your books. And um, one of the things he does is he gives people these random, these slightly blinded out uh, descriptions of experts on climate change. And so it'd be like, this person, you know, graduated from MIT and they teach it so and so and they have all these awards and da da da. And the only thing that will change in the explanation is what side of the debate they end up favoring. And it turns out that our definition of an expert is a credentialed person who agrees with me. The agrees with me comes first and then the credentials come second. Like you can't be an expert without the credentials, but you're not an expert if you don't agree with me. And so it's just whatever is here at the center of this, there is something here. Like, I don't think the authoritarian scale is measuring nothing. I don't think the trust scales are measuring nothing. I just don't think, I think we are sort of the blind man and the elephant with this stuff right now. I don't think we know quite what we are measuring or how to measure it. Um, and so we have these, the way we understood the Republican party psychology a couple of years ago, prior, prior to Trump and the Tea Party was that the Republican party was a very, um, again, on this sort of technical term of authoritarianism, like, like an authoritarian party where people really trusted the internal hierarchy, the structure, the foot soldiers really fell in line. And then like the Tea Party and Donald Trump showed that was completely wrong. The Republican party is internally total chaos and people don't stick with the people they were sticking with even two years ago. Look at the Republicans eating themselves in Georgia right now, just eating themselves. Like as soon as you say the, you know, I'm a Republican, always have been, I voted for Donald Trump, I endorsed him, I campaigned for him. It is my job to run elections in Georgia. Like you should trust me. And then like the two Republican Senate candidates say for the Georgia Republican Secretary of State to resign. There's no loyalty. There's nothing of the, of the tendency of, um, of actually trusting in traditional hierarchy happening here. So definitely like there is something going on around populist leaders, but it is, I guess one thing I will just say in all this and, and not just ramble on this thing that I'm struggling with endlessly is that I think a consistent mistake we are making in political analysis is underestimating, particularly in the modern world, given how flattened communications and power have gotten, is underestimating how important the actual preferences of the party bases are. And we don't understand those preferences at anything like the level of granularity we like to think we do. So it used to be those preferences were much more shaped and structured by media elites, by party elites, by party structures, but everything that has happened over the past 10 or 15 years in technology has like just destroyed these structures. And so there is much less mediation between what the people want and what they get. And I don't think we understand very well at all what people want. It's much more complex and in some ways self-contradictory than we've come to imagine because it used to be like energy that got channeled by parties into what the parties wanted. And that's becoming harder. And so now when these parties or media institutions end up betraying their people, they begin to lose their audiences really rapidly, right? Like Fox News losing audience to Breitbart and OAN News. It just turns out that their range of motion was much more uh, um, circumscribed than we thought. And I just, it's, I guess it's interesting, but it's, it's also a little, um, I think it should put a lot of humility on, on, on some of the theories get thrown around. Thanks so much, Ezra and Will. I think we've got about 20 minutes left and it's a good time to shift over to audience questions. We have a lot of questions queued up right now. So a question from John, certain folks both left and right frame current politics and the polarization as a matter of elites versus populace or as a matter of class. How credible do you find that view? And I think both of you could address that. I'll let Will go first because I just well, um, uh, I'm not quite sure. for a while. I'm not quite sure I understand the, the, the question. So the, 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 um, the, the polarization is, is of elite versus populist or matter of class. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure how those- I read, I, I, read this, I read this question on the back end. If I understand it correctly, and, and I can be corrected on this, um, I think part of the question is whether or not education has become class. And it's like educational class polarization has become the driver of a lot of this which is sort of like in this country, I would like associate it with like a, a Michael Lind view, like the managerial elite versus everybody else kind of argument. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I, clearly, I think that's that 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 is the sort of the the um, the, the symptom. Um, I mean, I think the I think that's more. I mean, that that, that is that is the polarization that we that we are discussing. Is 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 that kind of that 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 type of polarization, and that is um, the sort of rage that is felt towards many. Um, liberal metropolitan elites um, in kind of university towns and large globally connected cities and so on is one that uh, clearly kind of didn't sudden, suddenly start overnight. I mean, there is a kind of a, a, a sort of desire to kind of punish some of those figures that clearly kind of dates back um, a long time, I think. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, you could talk about the, the, the drastic failures of some of those elite figures with the financial crisis, which obviously in the US played a major part in the, the formation of the Tea Party and, and so on. And I think that um, look at populism in Southern Europe on the left wing populism as well as right wing populism. I mean, the, the conditions were, were set in place by the atrocious handling of the Euro crisis from 2010 onwards. That was what created the opportunities for people like Salvini on the right and Podemos on the left and Syriza, Syriza initially on the, on the kind of populist left. So I think that the sort of atrocious um, handling and the kind of in some ways entirely kind of correct sense that the fallout from the banking crisis was a sort of a, a sort of stitch up in certain respects, I think was a kind of total gift to to populists. I mean, populism uh, feeds off of off, off a sense of corruption more than it feeds off anything else. And sometimes that corruption, I mean, of course, you know, drain the swamp. I mean, it, sometimes the, 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 the corruption is 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 um, maybe not illegal corruption. It may sometimes it's entirely legal, but I think that that absolutely is, is it, it drives people further in, in different directions towards left and right. I'm not sure I'm answering the question, but I think that that, that that is certainly kind of how it presents itself. I'm not sure that gets to the explanation as to as, as to why it presents itself in that way. But so, so one thing I, I would add to this, so there's an ongoing debate, which I think this question may be keying off of on the way I would put this debate is is the polarization over cultural, driven by cultural capital or economic capital? So if you listen to Bernie Sanders explain what is driving the polarizations and divides of American politics, it's the billionaires and the millionaires versus everybody else. But the billionaires and millionaires have a lot of money, so they are able to get a lot of people onto their side by whipping up various kinds of resentments. And then if you listen to Fox News describe it or Donald Trump describe it or you know Josh Hawley describe it, it's like, woke liberal coastal elites versus everybody else, which doesn't, it doesn't exactly map onto capital because like in their view, Donald Trump and Robert Mercer are not woke cultural liberal elites, even though they're multi-billionaires. Well, Donald Trump may not be a multi-billionaire, but, um, but, but a bunch of these other guys are. Um, but it's much more about like, honestly, you see Santa Cruz, right? It's about the people who will tell you that you're, you know, um, full of privilege and you need to check your privilege before you talk and structural racism is everywhere and, and, and so on. And that there's a whole thing around this. And so I don't think there's a simple either or answer to this. I don't think the evidence supports a fundamentally economic capital understanding of polarization. And I know that there's like, a, I would say like a sort of continuous effort to create a bank shot version of this. So Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson, whose work I really respect and who are great political scientists, um, uh, Paul's at uh, Berkeley, actually, so a UC guy. Uh, their book, um, Let Them Eat Tweets, is sort of all about this. And the idea is basically that in order for these billionaires to maintain their position in protection society, they have ba they've more or less funded a cultural capital form of polarization. I, I think there's something to it, but also a ton of these guys are Democrats now. And if anything, what they, they and they're not that, and, and, and they, you know, they're not as liberal or progressive or socialist for that matter as Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, but I just don't think you see that. I, I don't think this maps as cleanly as you need it for that theory to really work in the long run. So I think there's something real to the cultural capital polarization. Um, but again, I think almost all of these are built on an idea that the elites are actually possessed of a little bit more power to structure the arguments and debates of society right now than they are. And I think one of the fundamental things happening is that elites of all kinds, cultural, economic, et cetera, have lost a lot of that power due to technological change, due to like Twitter, due to the way parties are now structured. And so you're actually getting something a lot closer to what animates the public. And those fights are not as well sorted as some of our 
like desires to sort them would would have it. Could, could I just come back and say one more one, one more yeah. thing? I mean, I think um, I, I agree with with what Ezra said there. I think that the one thing that strikes me as a continuity on the right is, I mean, in, in, in some of my earlier research, my PhD, I looked at the development of the free market kind of revolution that took hold in the 1970s and 80s with the rise of, of Reagan and Thatcher and so on. And I studied a lot of the ideas coming out of the University of Chicago and um, some of my PhD research. I went and interviewed people like Gary Becker and Richard Posner and, and these sorts of kind of quite ideological figures on the, on the, on the conservative right uh, in, in the United States. Um, and the continuity between that version of what I would call neoliberalism and a kind of contemporary kind of uh, cultural reaction, although I wouldn't say that, you know, someone like, I don't know, I imagine someone like Posner is probably not very happy with the figures like Trump, but nevertheless, there is a kind of a, a conti continuity, which is that um, what they resent um, is the idea that it's possible for political figures or media figures for that matter to speak for everybody. That, that the very question of the public interest is one that is um, a sort of um, left-wing uh, conceit. It is a kind of construct of a certain kind of worldview that for figures on the uh, free market right, like Friedrich Hayek and throughout the 20th century, is that you have these kind of what Hayek called intellectuals. Intellectuals are the baddies for Hayek because they're sort of, they have a tendency towards socialism. They have a tendency to kind of impose their values on everybody else. Now, this idea was there in the kind of the, the sort of reassertion of, of free market economics with the rise of, of Reagan and Thatcher in the 80s, because effectively for them, the danger of, of, of socialism is not just, or, or of any kind of Keynesian planning or whatever it might be, is not just that it's kind of inefficient, but that it actually kind of has a kind of tyrannical effect of trying to impose the kind of moral and cultural preferences of the planner upon everybody else. And I think that this similar kind of aspect of conservatism was there in the kind of rise of, of the Chicago School and, and Milton Friedman and all these sort of people. But it's a, that this is still a kind of defining feature of conservatism is that those people with all of their education and all of their expertise and all of their kind of political clout want to tell you how to live your life. And this has various kind of manifestations and it has a kind of free market manifestation, which is kind of get the government out of my sort of, you know, healthcare. And it has a cultural manifestation, which is get your kind of PhD out of my kind of media consumption in this sort of thing. So I think this is a sort of a, a continuity. And in that sense, it kind of is both, you know, it, it, it has economic and it has cultural manifestations. Uh, and I think that that's where, you know, um, somehow the right manages to cohere because you know, sometimes it can sort of manage to kind of bring together its sort of its sort of unruly kind of uh, explosive populism with its free market agenda. And of course, you know, one of the great kind of myths of the sort of rise of Trump and so on that I think we now hopefully all see through is the idea that, 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 that Trumpism was in any sense a kind of, you know, what Bannon called the kind of economic nationalism that was going to kind of, sort of benefit the working class in various ways. So. There's two questions here that I'd like to tie together that, that deal more with historical context. And the first is from Yana, do you see polarization as a repeating or ongoing cycle of history? And then the second one, um, isn't demonization of elites a recurrent theme in human history that we're seeing rise once again? If so, since this has happened in many times and places, what are the common conditions that cause its rise? And is there any way to avoid a culmination in violence? So I'll take at least uh, some parts of this. One is that it's really, really, really important when you're talking about polarization to be clear about what you're talking about. So there are sentiments, there are conflicts, there are divisions, there are arguments that are recurrent in, Ameri in, in global history and American history. When people say polarization has gone up in America, what we are saying, and this is really like the, the core point of, of my book, is that our disagreements, and I would also say our social identities and demographics, have become sorted between the two parties rather than mixed across them. So it is not my view that we are having brand new arguments in America, but it is different for the arguments to be as tightly structured between the two parties. Uh, I, I was talking a little bit about the, yeah, I was talking a little bit about this earlier, but you used to have quite a few liberal Republicans used to have a huge amount of conservative Democrats because Southern whites were all Democratic up until, you know, really basically the 80s. Um, it begins to change after 65 in the Civil Rights Act. Uh, it, 
a political system works very differently when its disagreements and its demographic competitions are structured as political party competition than when they are internal to the parties. Because when they are internal to the parties, when the parties are internally divided, they have an incentive to compromise or to suppress, right? To suppress the uh, issues that are going to create division or to compromise on them. And this is one reason I always tell people, don't look at the pre-polarized America with too much nostalgia. Um, a lot of what kept that political peace was an unbelievably brutal form of political suppression. So issues of race and civil rights deeply divided the democratic coalition. And so how were they handled? They were suppressed. They were suppressed by Dixiecrats who ran the House Rules Committee, suppressed by um, Dixiecrats who ran the Senate. And so civil rights bills were bottled up, anti-lynching laws were filibustered. These things simply weren't debated in our politics properly. Um, and then once that was broken, once the civil rights movement developed the power to break that suppression, that was the end of pre-polarized America, that sort of depolarized period, and the kind of long um, cycle of polarization were now in took place. So I really want to emphasize that because it's really, really different uh, when, when, when you operate that way. Um, so that's one thing. But yes, a lot of the, the underlying disputes and debates and, and, and arguments here, they're very old, right? Elites versus non-elites, um, you know, liberals versus conservatives, fear of demographic change, right? It could not possibly be older. And in one of the, one of the ways in which it is, I think, distinctive right now, uh, I have a whole chapter in the book about demographic change. And I do think a very important governing context of all American politics right now is how rapidly and how profoundly demographic of change is happening. So we are, I mean, in California here, we're racially already a majority minority state, but America is projected to become a majority minority nation by about 2042. But really importantly, this is happening on religion too. And I think people always underplay this. Uh, right now in the Democratic Party, the two parties used to be very similar religiously, but right now the religiously unaffiliated are the single largest religious group in the Democratic Party. And they're projected to overtake Protestants as the single largest religious group in the country around 2040 as well. Um, and then you also, we are on pace to have a record number of foreign born residents in, in America in the next couple of years. And so the country really is changing. Who has power in it is changing. That is then reflected in our culture, which tends to sort of run ahead of those changes a little bit, but also in our politics, like with the election of the first black president, and that creates a huge political response, and it has reshaped the parties between basically a party that is very comfortable and even excited about these changes, about this resorting of, of demographic and political power, the now the Democratic Party, um, and a party that is fighting them, that wants to make America great like it was back in the day before all this had happened, which is the Republican Party. Um, I mean, I, you know, on the, on, on the second question, I mean, this is the sort of, this is obviously the concern uh, about um, where eventually, how far does populism or, or kind of anti-elite rhetoric go? Um, and I mean, my book, um, Nervous States, has some fairly, I suppose, fairly kind of um, sort of uh, sort of grim <laughs> sort of envisionings of, 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 of the sort of alternative to um, how, what, what does politics look like once the very possibility of, of, of the bare minimum of consensus is possible? Because in some ways, what get called elites, and I think elites is, a, is, a, is not a good term, because I think elites already is a, is, a, is, a, is a pejorative term that refers to a type of power that, that, that has a kind of legitimacy, kind of um, an illegitimacy about it. Um, and I think that the, you know, it's, it's when people start to target um, the courts, when you get executive leaders targeting the courts, uh, declaring as, as Trump has that the media are the, are the enemy of the people. Um, I mean, we've had some, um, you know, th things recently around Brexit, where courts have been kind of targeted by newspapers, actually, but recently we have um, a new Home Secretary who's responsible for immigration, who has basically started blaming immigration on what she calls activist lawyers. Um, and there's been, you know, already there's been concerns about the safety of, of some human rights lawyers and this sort of thing. So these sorts of things are, are obviously, you know, they, they, they begin in a, in a very fringe way. But I mean, this is the this is the reason why it's important to try and hold a line around 
uh, certain kind of forms of rhetoric not being deployed um, such that people, when, they're, when they are attempting to do their jobs it, as, 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 as justices, as reporters and, and, and so on, that, they, that this, this notion of a kind of enemy within, the, or that they are kind of the, the, the sort of loyalty of these people to the nation. I mean, this is the beginning of far right politics, which of course, um, this, this, this line has been crossed in many ways, um, in many nations around the world over the last um, kind of five or six years. So, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't want to make any kind of particularly grim predictions, but I think that, I mean, one of the things I try to do in the book by returning the whole way back to the thought of Thomas Hobbes, who was writing about the need for, for, for the state in the wake of the, some of the worst um, decades of violence that, that Europe had experienced in the 30 years war, um, that the, um, in some ways, the, the, the reason, I mean, the, the alternative to a bare minimal consensus is that everything becomes disputable. And that's the, the, the sort of, in some ways, where the, the, the very foundations of, of liberal political theory start is, 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 is how can we start to build from violence towards consensus, and, and and I mean Hobbes's answer to that is is not a particularly attractive one either. But it's it's a very it's a very very minimal idea of what human beings want, and and I think that you know this that the, the, these processes can go into reverse, and that's why um, we're, we're we're sort of living in a state of anxiety at the moment politically. Um, but we shouldn't be kind of you know we don't have to be pessimistic. And one of the things that I mean we don't need to be kind of we need to be sort of anxious, but we don't need to kind of assume the worst. And one of the things I, I really kind of admired about Ezra's book actually was precisely the reminder that um, the, the, the consensus politics can also be kind of sort of repressing all, form, all other forms of violence that simply don't kind of get kind of, kind of represented politically. And I think that there is um, the, 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 the sort of this idea that, that consensus needs to be kind of imposed upon people, regardless of human suffering, is also kind of extremely sort of uh, suspect. And I think you could say that in different ways, I mean, not in any way comparable to what Ezra was describing about a kind of pre-Civil Rights Act America, but I think that, you know, you could look at uh, populism in, in Mediterranean Europe as being uh, a sort of almost this kind of pushback against um, the consensus surrounding the, the, the euro and the consensus surrounding austerity, which was a kind of consensus that was sort of manufactured and basically just sort of imposed on people without any kind of democratic legitimacy at all. So you can, there, you can have too much consensus, but I think you can also have too little consensus. And that in some ways is the sort of art of politics is, is what lies somewhere between those two things. We've got about two minutes left. And I wonder, I'm gonna combine two questions again, and then if you could each speak for just a minute, then <laughs> that would be wonderful. So this is from Demetrius and also from one of our CSP students, Jordan. How do we as future leaders foster inclusivity in our politics and our studies and our media consumption? And how do we regain trust in each other and our institutions, especially when it's getting increasingly difficult to reach out to one another? Ezra, do you wanna start? Sure, um, and I just want to say I've seen the questions in the back end. They're great, and so I'm sorry we've all talked so long and didn't get to more of them. Um, maybe another time. This is also a hard question that I have a two-minute answer for. Uh, I will give, but I'll try to give two. Let me give two principles. Actually, one principle that will play out two ways, which is democracy. So one way I think you're going to foster inclusivity in our political um, uh, actual structures is that if we democratize America. We would be a more inclusive, diverse polity if we were actually more of a majoritarian democracy, if the Senate didn't massively overrepresent white voters through its um, small, through the way it uh, equally represents states, if the Electoral College didn't um, keep throwing the election or nearly throwing the election. Uh, the Republican Party that had to actually win 50% plus one of the vote would be a more inclusive and diverse party. So this is a big, again, something I, I, I go into in more detail in my book, but I believe that I, polarization is a problem, but to me, the single biggest thing we do to fix the American political system, not make it perfect or idyllic or utopic, just better, is simple democratization. That said, um, I would say there is a thicker conception of democracy going way, way, way back into both American and other philosophical history uh, about democracy as an act about how we treat each other. And I find a lot of the people who use words like inclusivity are not in fact in any way inclusive. Um, they're very inclusive people who agree with them, but not at all inclusive of people who don't. And there's a real culture that I would call almost anti-political, um, like the culture of like, I can't even with these people, they're terrible opinions 
or it's not my job to educate you. That is like, there's nothing I hate in politics, like hearing in politics like that. It's true that it's not your job if you don't want to be part of politics, to be part of politics. But if you want a better political system, then it actually is your job. It is your act as a citizen to try to persuade people. And you can't persuade people if you don't come to them in a spirit where they feel they're going to be listened to generously and taken as their best selves, even when you think they're wrong. It's really important. You're not going to get people to respond to you the way you want them to unless you're able to respond to them that way. It's a really difficult practice. Like I can tell you somebody who partially professionally talks to people I really don't agree with all the time. Those conversations are not productive. If I walk into them with a sense that I'm going to win or I'm going to show you why you're an idiot and you're wrong. So I think we need to be more democratized on the macro scale. But I also think we need a better conception of what it means to act democratically on a micro scale. And so I really would urge people to, to, to try to invest in democracy as a value and as a practice. And I'll just give one, um, there's a beautiful book by the Harvard classicist, Daniel Allen. She's a, the head of the Stafford Center for Ethics there. She's an African-American political theorist. Um, it's a book from a couple of years ago called Talking to Strangers. And I just think it's one of the really beautiful things written on this. And, and I, would, I would urge people to look up her work and her more recent work for, for more on this. But I think we need, on the left in particular, a thicker conception of democracy as a political priority, but then a better conception of what it means for us to act democratically in a way that includes people we don't agree with in the political conversation and uh, acts towards people as if we want to pull them over and persuade them, not as if we want to condemn and exclude them. Will, a final thought? Yeah, I mean, and, and I, I, I agree with, with, with everything Ed was just said. And I think, you know, in, in my own country, we have real problems that, that could be improved through forms of constitutional reform and, and democratization. But politicians often don't see the self-interest in, in, in engaging those things, which is one of the problems. One thing we haven't talked about, and we're not going to start going into it now, but is the whole kind of vaccination, anti-vax kind of problem. And one of the things which, I mean, it, it, maybe uh, things might be worse in other countries than ours, I mean, but one thing which I, I, I think possibly could come out of this pandemic, which is good, is um, the, the problem of trust is not how to suddenly kind of force people to, to suddenly trust people they don't trust. You know, having Joe Biden getting vaccinated on live TV is not going to change anyone's mind about vaccinations because, you know, Conspiracy theorists can can deal with that, <laughs> um, but I think you know what we what we're seeing um, at the moment is much greater understanding of all of the kind of different reasons why science works as it does, and there was a much greater attention to sort of you know the the place of experts in public life. Why do they know what they know? Why have you know what what are the regulatory systems? I'm not saying we can kind of educate the whole population in great detail about the kind of nature of risk assessment and the nature of regulation. But I feel that like the, the, the sort of bare sort of bones and technology of, 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 of politics and, and government at the moment is being kind of exposed and, and, and is being sort of reflected on and thought about in, in a way that hasn't really happened un until recently. And, you know, at the moment we're having kind of news reports about exactly kind of, you know, how, how close is the vaccine kind of to, you know, it's could be put onto a truck and it's now being driven this, you know, there's a sense that actually, you know, science isn't just something that happens a long way away. I mean, granted what Ezra said about the kind of shock of, of people kind of remaining entrenched in their positions in spite of, of, of the deaths going on around them. But I think that there's a sort of, I think that what could change is, a sort of, um, you know, a, a greater attention to exactly why people know what they know and, and why we trust who we trust. And I'm not saying that will overcome the, some of the kind of divisions that Ezra was talking about, but I do think that something might be might be changing at the moment. Well, I want to thank both of you, Ezra and Will, so much for the stimulating conversation. I'm sorry I have to cut it short now. And I want to thank all of the members of the audience who joined us today. Thank you. Thank you.